succeed in raising the capital that they were looking for. So we're, we're super excited and we hope that you'll take an opportunity to check out what we're doing with CSI Catalyst. Another core program that we're working on and we're delighted to be working with Microsoft Canada on is something called Catapult Microloans. So Catapult Microloans is a, 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 a first of its kind in Canada to be able to create and provide access to microloans, five to $25,000, to help social enterprises get their project to the next step. Working in partnership uh, between the Center for Social Innovation and Microsoft, and involving other players like the TD Bank, the Government of Ontario, uh, I'll turn a credit, I'm looking at Cranny because I always forget the number, Social Capital Partners and KPMG, did I do it? Prob I, I said that. Did I say them? Yeah, yeah got the neck good. Uh, what's been super exciting is watching how small investments, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars going invested into a project at just the right time, at just the right moment, can make all of the difference. And so this partnership with Microsoft has been wonderful. Last about what, a month ago now, we made investments into four small organizations and already we're starting to see. So just to give you an example, we gave a, um, a microloan to the Toronto Tool Library which is a sharing library to be able to stimulate and support people to be able to access to sharing tools. Doesn't sound like much, but boy oh boy, pretty cool to watch how the sharing economy is changing the game. Anyway, one of the other programs that we're really involved in is something called the Agents of Change program. As so many of you know, it's really about the skills and knowledge that you have applied to the change that you want to see. The Agents of Change program is a, uh, a recruitment program to be able to engage young social entrepreneurs and to provide them with the training and the support, the peer networks, and the knowledge that they need to help to accelerate their project to become more impactful. This is another program that we're working closely with Microsoft Canada on to be able to help support young early stage organizations to be able to move their projects forward in the world. So this is just gives you a high level, uh, some sense of the kind of work that the Center for Social Innovation does. Um, very much, very much interested in how we're supporting the not-for-profit, the charitable sector, to be able to get access to the tools, the resources, and the knowledge of people that they need to succeed. And that is why working with TechSoup Canada, and let me tell you about how this fits in and why I'm here with you to introduce you to the TechSoup Canada and the Office 365 for nonprofits program. The Center for Social Innovation believes in empowering nonprofit organizations to make change. And so six, five, six, five years ago now, we worked collaboratively together with Jane and others to be able to support the creation and the integration of TechSoup Canada uh, across the country. TechSoup, and Jane will introduce it, TechSoup will, uh, how many people are, are are you all members of TechSoup? You guys already know all this stuff, don't you? Yeah, yeah you're like, oh, geez, it's old hat. Listen, all that really matters here is that we all have a shared desire to have an impact in the world. We couldn't be happier to be the home for TechSoup Canada. We couldn't be happier to be working with our partners at Microsoft to help accelerate the success of the sector. And with that, I'm going to turn the show over to our executive director of TechSoup Canada, who will then uh, officiate and host the rest of the morning for you. I just want to thank you all so much for being a part of CSI. If you want to hear more about what we do, uh, you can talk to anybody at the front desk. Leah Pollock is here in the back corner here. She can answer any questions. Uh, Dave Cranenberg, our director of programming. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day. And now I'd like to introduce you to the executive director of TechSoup Canada, Jane Zhang. Welcome, good morning everyone. I hope you all had the chance to get some tea and coffee and water. Um, as Tanya has mentioned, I am the de Executive Director of TechSoup Canada. Uh, we would not have been made possible if it wasn't for the generosity and support of the Centre for Social Innovation for the last five years. Um, how many of you are actually new to TechSoup Canada? Any show of hands? Okay, so uh, the rest of you please bear with me. We. We offer quite a few uh, programs at, at TechSoup Canada. One of the main things that we do is the software donations program, where we work with over 28 donor partners. Uh, Microsoft is one of them, but we are also collaborating with Adobe, Symantec, uh, Cisco, and our latest donor partner is actually Dharma Online Merchant Services. 
Uh, we're really, really excited about having them on board because, as you know, a lot of the uh, things we do now are moving online, so payments and everything is uh, more and more going online. And Dharma has been rated as one of the top customer service uh, companies for online uh, merchant accounts in North America. So we're very, very excited to have them as our latest donor partner. In, in addition to our uh, software donations program, we also offer a lot of learning opportunities on our website at TechSoupCanada.ca. Uh, the lovely Tierney Smith is head of our community engagement. So you probably have seen a lot of uh, her work on, on our website, our, a lot of our blogs and learning articles. Um, Many of you probably have been exposed to the Jane versus Tyranny series where we go out and <laughs> uh, find tools that we're passionate about for different things like uh, how do you come up with newsletters and then we battle it out to see which tool uh, we like the best. So um, we also have the Toronto Net Tuesday event that we do hope many of you will come to. That is a monthly event that we put on. Uh, we usually choose the theme every month. I think the one we had this week was on crowdfunding. Um, where we bring experts in the field to come in and talk to you about the latest technology and we can share best practices. Uh, which brings me to something I do want to share with you before we start talking about Office, 3, Office 365. And I know this is something that Raman probably won't want to come up here to say, so I'll say it for you, Raman. Out of the 28 donor partners that we have, Microsoft has always been the leader in terms of when it comes to corporate social responsibility. So when we launched TechSoup Canada five years ago, with the donor partners at that time, there were only two donor partners that were open to both charities and nonprofits. Microsoft Canada was one of them. They worked really hard to expand the donation program to as many nonprofit organizations out there as possible. In fact, their dedication to the donor program was so large that this year, in March, uh, they helped us to uh, expand the, our donations uh, eligibility to 20 of, other, uh, 20 of our other donor uh, programs. So now 160,000 organizations in Canada are able to take advantage of as much as, of our dona donation program as possible. And a month ago, Microsoft Canada expanded their eligibility to faith-based organizations as well as hospices. So a big thank you, Microsoft, for doing this. And as you know, most of the software is donated. So I do want to give you guys a number. Uh, when you pay the admin fee that you come in, um, when you order your software, that admin fee goes to running of TechSoup Canada, not a penny goes to Microsoft. So in a year, Microsoft donates about $30 million worth of software to our sector in Canada. That's $30 million that you can then use for your programs and services. That's a lot of savings. So this is why I really do want to give a big thanks to Microsoft. And uh, thank you for coming today to bring everybody, all the experts to the field. And thank you for your ongoing support. With the Office 365 program, it is a, li a little bit different. So for those of you that know about our donations program, that you know you come to TechSoup's website, you choose the software you want, you check out. But with Office 365, you are actually going straight to Microsoft. They are taking care of the whole process for you to make sure that you have the best experience possible. What our part is, is going to be assisting Microsoft in the vetting of uh, whether or not you're a nonprofit organization and making sure that we have all of the documents ready. So I do want you guys to know that this is again one of the uh, dedications that Microsoft has shown to our community. Uh, they believe in this so much that they really want to make sure that you are supported from the beginning to the end of your experience here. Which brings me to uh, the introduction of our lovely panelists today. Um, as you know, with Office 365, with technologies changing, it's always hard to figure out what technology to use and what, how do you know if it's the right technology for you and also what kind of help can you get uh, to help you get started. So Samit is the, uh, tech, is the program lead. Uh, business group lead. Business group yeah. lead, I am so sorry. I'm okay. so used to saying tech or program. 
uh, for our Microsoft Office, he's going to talk to you about what is Office 365 and why should you move to the cloud. We also have Kevin who is going to share some of his experiences with the use of Office 365 for his organization. And also Michael from Hotcom uh, is going to talk to you about uh, support that you may be able to get in how do you actually deploy Office 365 for your organization. So I'm going to now <coughs> give it over to Sunit, and uh, I hope you will enjoy your session today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, as Jane said, I'm Sunit Kanai, head up the uh, Microsoft Office Division for Microsoft Canada. I'm responsible for all aspects of the business, uh, revenue, marketing, customer satisfaction, as it pertains to the Office portfolio, which includes Office 365, uh, Microsoft Exchange, uh, and of course the apps that all Canadians love to use, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, those popular ones. Um, you know, I've been with Microsoft for, for nine years and I consider myself very lucky to work for this company. Um, it really, uh, giving back to the community that we reside in and that we work in uh, is very key to this, uh, this organization and that aligns really well with what's important to me. I believe I'm really fortunate uh, to live in a great country such as Canada and uh, living in the Masaga community, I definitely want to give back to that community that I live in. Uh, I'm an active volunteer, uh, and Microsoft allows me to be an active volunteer. Uh, they allow me a minimum of 40 hours paid time off a year, so I can go and volunteer and spend time with, uh, uh, with the charities and the causes that I feel strongly about. Uh, as you can see Teddy here with me, uh, he's an autism service doc that I'm training currently, so I'm a foster puppy raiser uh, in my spare time. And I'm also on the board of two uh, not-for-profit organizations as well. And there he goes. He's letting himself, uh, he's letting us know that he's here. <laughs> if he gets too rambunctious, I might hand him off to some of my, some of my team members. Uh, but I think he's settled in for, uh, for the event. Um, you know, I was thinking about um, uh, what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, and something that I went through this summer sort of uh, uh, surfaced in my mind. And I wanted to share an experience that I went through. Uh, as being a, uh, a board member on one of the not-for-profits that I work for, we needed to get accredited to, uh, uh, to continue our funding from, from the LIN. Uh, and so we, two, two other board members apart from me worked on this accreditation program. Uh, and one of the things that it required was a review and update of some of our internal policy documents. Uh, and the board members, they're volunteering their time as well. Uh, and it was very difficult for us to coordinate our schedules. Uh, so one of the things we ended up doing was we said, you know, let's just work on these policy documents and email them to each other. Uh, in less than a week, we all had at least five emails in our inboxes with ten attachments each, and all these Word documents looked really similar with slightly different file names. I couldn't figure out for the life of me, you know, what was the final document that, uh, that someone had edited, had someone undone the work that I had done, uh, and was I looking at the latest version. Uh, I quickly uh, decided there has to be a better way to do this, uh, and how can technology help us? I set up a folder uh, on SkyDrive Pro, and I shared that with the two other people that I was working with. Uh, and we started collaborating on this one document that we were all working on. The three of us could get in that document at the same time uh, and access that document, whether uh, from work, uh, on their work computer, uh, at home on their laptop, or even on their tablets uh, at home or at work. And we knew now that we were working on the same document, and it was very easy for me to track the changes that other people were making to these policy documents. It just really helped us get more productive and reduced a whole bunch of uh, rework that we were uh, staring down, uh, staring down, and having to continue to go along the old path. Uh, the board was so happy at this experience that I've now got them using a shared OneNote where we track all our board meeting minutes. So board members that are dialing in remotely can look at what's being transcribed in that meeting on their shared OneNote as the person in the room is typing. Uh, and we're, we're also getting the subcommittees that we formed as part of this board uh, to use OneNote as well to keep us informed um, of all the updates and, and the work that they're progressing on. Hey, Teddy. Um, so, you know, that was a real uh, uh, moment for me where I experienced during the summer how technology can really make us more productive. And regardless of whether you're working with full-timers in your organization or volunteers helping your organization, you know, technology can have a real impact on how we can be more productive. Um, and that's one of the things we're here to talk about today is Microsoft's latest offering, which is Office 365 for nonprofits. With over 85,000 charities in Canada that are not-for-profits in Canada and over 2 million professionals working in the space, 
we believe there's an incredible opportunity for us to make these professionals more productive, increase collaboration uh, with the use of Office 365. And that's what we want to talk about today and share with you today. Before I go on, I thought it would be great for us to hear from an organization that has already adopted Office 365 uh, and, and hear their story and, and what are some of the benefits that they've, uh, they've experienced. So with that, I want to turn it over to Kevin from uh, Brampton Caledon Community Living to share some of his experiences. Welcome, Kevin. Um, Kevin, tell me a little bit more about what Brampton Caledon Community Living does uh, and, and what were some of the challenges you guys were facing? Um, well, like I said, thank you. Um, my name is Kevin. I'm, from I'm an information technologist at Brampton Caledon Community Living. Uh, Brampton Caledon Community Living um, is a nonprofit charitable organization. We support people with developmental and intellectual disabilities, um, help them lead meaningful and enriched lives throughout the community, um, with partnership with their families and all that. We we decided to go with Office 365 back in March of this year. Uh, we've been using it since then. Uh, we went we were looking at a new email system. Our current email server was you know just kind of pushing along. We kind of had it for years um, before I even started there myself. Um, and it was time for an upgrade, so we looked at all the different options. Um, and one of the options, of course, that's being talked about a lot is the cloud, so we started looking into that. Um, and through that, we found Office 365. We found a couple of the other options as well. And kind of, you know, we, through our research, because we're using Microsoft products already, you know, we have Windows, we have Office, you know, the Microsoft Office suite. Um, we kind of just went and decided, you know, we'll look at Office, you know, Office 365 solution. Um, originally, we were just looking at hosted email. Um, we approached um, one of our, te our tech partner, te Oddcom. Um, we, of course, approached other partners as well. We you know, can't just choose one. But um, we went through the whole process, and we found the whole Office 365 suite for nonprofits. Um, you know, for, you know, at the cost that it is, we ended up paying a small maintenance fee to help Oddcom manage it with us. But at the cost of you know nothing, we were able to get the full Microsoft you know Office 365 suite, Outlook, SharePoint, SkyDrive, um, and just start using it. We um, so this, it was a slow implementation. It took us about I think, two or three months to fully get it out to all of our employees. We have over 300 staff spread across 43 locations. 35 of those being operational 24/7, seven, seven days a week. Um, so, you know, one of the biggest challenges before it was, you know, we had one server in one office that everybody connected to through, you know, DSL connection. So, you know, it was really slow, um, slow internet, so it was slow for the staff at the office, it was slow for the staff accessing it from all the different locations. Uh, once we moved to Office 5, allowed us to, of course, you know, now we're not accessing it from our office. You know, of course, that office has to sit out, but they have access from inside. Uh, they have, sorry, I'm not used to speaking. Um, we have access from you know all the offices, much faster connections. People stop complaining about how slow it was. Um, you know, and now we don't have to worry about you know if the internet goes down at our office, if the server, we're still everybody's going to still have access to their email and all the other files. Um, we've currently started. I don't know, we're going or we're going? All right. Um, sorry. So we started off with our email. We migrated all of our email from our current on-site exchange um, to you know, our current email server um, off to the Office 365. We started using that. Uh, we started seeing all the other benefits to Office 365. Um, you know, internally we started using the, you know just the finance department and the IT department, the more tech-savvy group of staff to start using the full feature set of Office 365 and we started seeing the full benefit, you know, of being able to work on one document. Um, you know, the finance department had a lot of benefits there, um, having, you know, one central set of files. The fact that we are, you know, multi-office, we have, you know, 43 locations total. Um, it might be off by one or two, uh, but, you know, spreading out so much, having access to all of the documentation in one central space, we're starting to see a benefit in that. So we started uh, implementing for other departments. Um, 
we are fully not implemented across the board yet for Officer 65 towards the SharePoint and SkyDrive areas. Uh, we are fully implemented for email, um, and we are slowly moving towards that though. Uh, we have plans in the future to make sure we do use Officer 65, um, the full suite, SkyDrive and SharePoint. Um, also Link, we are starting to look at. Um, I know some departments we gave it to and they've been using it themselves. We have other departments and they don't use it. Um, but we also have a large user base of non-technical savvy people. About, I would say probably more than 80% of our staff, you know, uh, you know, barely know how to turn a computer on, you know, let alone check, you know. So we've been slowly getting them to move forward and in having this, you know, Microsoft Suite, which is, again, very familiar, they are do use a computer, um, allows us to then, you know, make a much easier learning curve for them. Um, we, you know, it's a little bit of a struggle sometimes, certain staff resist the change, um, and that's just the nature of people um, resisting change, technology, um, which is, you know, one of the challenges we've faced towards it still, but at the same time, with the fact that it is, you know, a Microsoft product, it is, you know, we're using Microsoft products as they are now, it is a much easier learning curve. I've seen a lot higher adoption with it than some of the other programs we've tried to push out, just because of the fact that it is familiar. Um, Kevin, um, you talked about adoption, so and some of the benefits you guys have experienced yourself. Uh, what's uh, share with us what are some of your personal aha moments where you've had, hey, this has really helped me become more productive, or what are some of the features that you really like? That, uh, so for me personally, I'm, you know, I'm in IT, so I know all the technical sides. So we've used a lot of the documentation internally. We've switched, originally we had a lot of paper documentation, a lot of stuff that wasn't documented properly internally for on our side. Um, so we started exploring what options we could use with the Microsoft, you know, with Office 365, and one of the issues we always had was knowing what, um, and I'm sorry if it's too technical, but what IP addresses are on what servers and what, and all that, and we, you know, always had trouble with that. We used the Visio diagram before, we never were really able to keep it up to date. We always lose copy of what version was the most recent one. We always, you know, end up losing it. So we ended up starting to start right onto um, SharePoint site. Um, and one of the benefits to sharing on the SharePoint site was you also get a visual reputation right built into the site. So one of those documents, uh, visual diagram, if you don't know what that is, it's just um, like a flow chart. Um, on the IT side of things, they have a flow chart, but it has pictures of servers and computers. Um, so we get ready to keep that saved onto our site, and now we have access to it all the time. Um, so whether I'm in the office or out of the office, if I need to pull up an address that I need, um, on the network, or if I just you know have to reference something, or even just to show my boss kind of what our network looks like and how it's been growing, I have that all availability right from the SharePoint site. Um, and I know it works the same for Excel documents, Word documents as well. Um, and generally speaking, in the team, we don't really work with that many Excel Word documents for ourselves, uh, but we do work with other documents that have had a huge benefit there. And have you found that uh, you know? Uh, some of your employees are geographically dispersed, definitely. Uh, what about in terms of accessing information on any device? Do they all use Windows machines, or are they able to access this information across a variety of machines, whether it be a desktop, a laptop, or a tablet of any sort? Yeah, so um, not for all our support staff, but for our managers. We have a huge management team that works, you know, all work collaboratively of different groups, um, not just with their staff, but with each other. Um, and one of the biggest things though is, you know, they had to carry their laptops around a lot. Um, we also have, you know, I'll get to the second part later, but sorry. Um, with, the, uh, with the deployment of Office 365, um, we were looking at switching to cell phone providers. And at the same time, we ended up switching and we, went to the, we were looking at different options. Of course, Blackberry at the time was a little iffy, so we switched to Windows phones uh, because we were switching towards Office 365. And, you know, again, the whole usability side of it. Users are used to using their Windows computers, so we figured giving them a Windows phone, not gonna be much of a, hopefully not much of a difference for them. Um, so with the deployment of Windows phones, they now have access to all their documents on their phone that they have on the computer using SkyDrive. Um, you know, of course, their emails are all there as well, but using the SkyDrive app and the Office apps on your phone, the, phone, they have access to documents on their phone, so when they're on their go, 
they could just pull up, they want to reference something, they could just pull it up on their phone. Um, I know a couple managers have come up and thanked me with a hug for that. Um, it's been really great for a lot of them, um, especially the ones, you know, navigate computer, the ones who don't know how to navigate computer as well, they've gone through it and they find it really easy to use. It's, oh, it's that easy, you know? Um, once I showed them how to do it, they were, you know, surprised that it was actually that simple. Um, so being able to access their documents from their phone to their uh, laptops, which is great, because um, they're very mobile, having so many locations, the management team needs to be able to move around. Um, so having that availability on their phone, they don't need to bring their laptop with them when they go to the locations for visits. Um, just adds that you know extra level of you know being movability, access, having access to everything right there on their phone is great. Uh, one of the key benefits, and this is the one that I think was written down in my notes, um, is we have an on-call team, which is um, right now three managers who are essentially <coughs> dedicated to being on call. They don't work during the day, they only work after hours. Um, and current, um, there's in the transition still, um, but they already see the benefits. We are currently, um, they just arrived in my office last week, we got ready them um, tablets, Windows 8 tablets, for them to use with um, SIM cards in them so they have access to the files wherever they are. Um, we had slowly transitioned to laptops a couple years ago for them, but it's still really hard for them to use a laptop and go around. Um, you know, so they still have to carry that laptop around with them. Um, you know, it's much nicer than what we used to have, which is a huge binder full of paper. Uh, but then we started looking at better options, which we switched to um, Windows 8 tablets now. We tried it out with one of the on-call managers. Uh, we decided to issue it out to the one who is the least computer savvy of them to do our best test. Um, and they've loved it. Um, they now have access to all their files right there, wherever they are. Um, they don't need to carry their laptop around. So if they get a call, you know, if, you know, they're out having dinner at a restaurant. They get the call. They could go take, you know, just go off to the side, bring their tablet right there. They get the call finished, then they get back to their dinner. Um, you know, um, so it's also really good. A lot of these, you know, it's great. Thank you for sharing. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> What I love about that is, uh, you know, uh, Brand McCallum and Community Living, they've been able to adopt O365 at their own pace, and they've been able to, first they've started with their email, uh, and now they're slowly moving on to SharePoint and other parts of Office 365 as well. So I love the fact that, you know, you guys are going at your own pace, you're able to, uh, you know, uh, the change management that you have in place sounds to be really solid in terms of slowly moving people across the organization onto these workloads as well. I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about O365 and explaining the offer that, uh, that Microsoft is making available to, to nonprofits. O365 at its very core uh, is uh, software as a service. Uh, Microsoft will host and store all your data, your settings, and allow, and allow them to roam with you, thereby making this information available to you from anywhere and across any device, whether it be a laptop, a desktop, a tablet, or a phone. We've taken our business class services and made them available uh, in O365. Uh, with uh, email, uh, we provide email through our, Teddy's, Teddy's getting restless there. Uh, we provide email uh, through Microsoft Exchange, most exchange. Uh, we allow you uh, to uh, indulge in web conferencing and instant messaging via Microsoft Link. And we allow file sharing and storage with uh, Microsoft SharePoint as well. And we've taken these cloud services and we've paired them up with web versions of our most popular applications like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote. And what this does is this allows users to access this information, whether it be their email, uh, start up a web conference, or, or an IM session, instant messaging session, or collaborate on a document that's stored on the SharePoint using these uh, web versions of Word, Excel, and PowerPoint from anywhere across any device. Whether you're on a Windows device, uh, or any other uh, platform, you can access these services through a web browser. And again, this is enterprise-grade reliability. Microsoft stores all this information in their data centers. It's available for you 24-7. Uh, uh, and we're making this uh, Office 365 offering available to not-for-profits on a donation basis, at no cost to not-for-profits today. So that's something that I really encourage you guys to learn more about and, and take advantage of as well. For organizations, that are looking for a more premium experience. 
at a heavily discounted price, we also allow not-for-profits to download the uh, desktop applications right onto your machines. So Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, you can download all of those to your machines and use them there. And we know that people are on the move and you are using their uh, smartphones uh, to collaborate and get more done from anywhere as well. So we've made our office applications available on mobile phones as well, across Windows phones, iPhones, or Android phones as well, uh, for people who want to take advantage of that premium experience as well. So in essence, you can access all your information, whether it be your email, whether it be documents that you're working on, or information that's stored uh, that's critical to your organization from anywhere. Uh, as long as you have access to a browser, uh, you can access that information and, and collaborate with others inside your organization or outside your organization as well. So with that, what I thought is I'd, I'd uh, uh, introduce Michael as well from OddComp. Michael, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, uh, uh, you're a cl Microsoft Cloud Deployment Partner. I'm wondering if you can help explain uh, to the audience here, what is a Cloud Deployment Partner? Uh, and also, what are, uh, what are the advantages to a not-for-profit for working with a partner such as yourselves and others to deploy Office 365 in their organization? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, a cloud deployment partner from Microsoft basically is a, a certified Microsoft partner that has uh, the trained professional staff to help organizations to, uh, to migrate successfully to a cloud platform. Um, we're a partner that uh, not only uh, uh, have trained professional already uh, have expertise in the typical Microsoft technology, but they also have to be certified on uh, cloud uh, certifications as well. So therefore, with that type of uh, 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 experts, then we can help organizations like yours to transform uh, your, your infrastructure to, to run on the cloud. Um, a lot of uh, your, your, your typical challenge uh, from our experience working with nonprofit is uh, sometimes often the lack of uh, budget, um, the lack of expertise. Uh, you may have a very uh, small team, uh, sometimes Maybe just that one person. That one person could be sharing many hats, including IT, or no, no people at all. And you may not have a direction as to how to move your, your organization to the cloud. So we're acting as that layer to help uh, organizations like yours to, to move to the next step. Uh, you're probably at this crossroad now. Your, your, your equipment is aging. Um, you don't know where to go. Should you budget for the next phase to buy uh, new hardware? Uh, with that purchase, typically includes uh, 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 hardware, software licensing, and other uh, types of soft costs as well. Going with Office 365 basically uh, eliminates uh, that, that headache. Um, you no longer now have to afford uh, hardware. You don't have to. You don't have to budget and size your 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 growth uh, uh, anymore. Basically, it's it's pay as you go and it's, you know, uh, grows with you. If your organization has 10 people, 50 people, tomorrow it grows to 100 people, just get more subscription and that's it. So uh, uh, you may be at this uh, crossroad where you're limited in, 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 in designing that budget. Um, uh, maybe think about your growth for the next three years or five years or anything like that and then uh, place your purchase according uh, to that. So basically that, that eliminates uh, that out of the equation. So um, we act as that layer to help uh, uh, you to, to design, uh, implement, and, and consult with you what's the right next step. Thanks, Michael. In your experience in dealing with uh, not-for-profit customers, what's the biggest challenge that they're facing currently uh, when they're thinking of migrating to a service like Office 365, and how can you guys help with that specific challenge? Um, I think, the, uh, uh, like I mentioned just now, it's um, probably the lack of expertise and maybe perhaps a, a, a fear uh, to, to move your organization into cloud. You're, you're scared about security, you're scared about uh, uh, and your data going somewhere that is not, uh, not safe. Um, I can assure you, you know, uh, putting your data on the Microsoft platform, it, it's absolutely safe. Uh, your data, in fact, is more secure because uh, they put it in a proper data center with enterprise-grade hardware to run it. Um, it it's, uh, it's, it's not a concern for, 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 for any type of organizations. Um, so, so what we do is um, uh, uh, 
we, we help your IT team or yourself um, uh, acting as your IT team to, uh, to help you migrate because uh, we realize uh, most nonprofits probably have the budget focus on their own programs and on their agencies and stuff like that. So uh, you probably seldom we have uh, uh, put your IT budget to, to primarily work on IT. So, um, uh, so we act as that uh, 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 middle people to, to kind of uh, make sure uh, that you are comfortable with the migration. Uh, we explain to you what it is, uh, what the end result could be. We work with uh, all levels of your organizations, not only just uh, from the director level, but also uh, to down to the user level as well. Make sure that they know what to expect, uh, and so that uh, the transition becomes smooth. Like Kevin just mentioned, you know, most people resist change. Uh, we are there to help uh, all users within the organization to to adapt to that change and hopefully make that transition smooth. Thanks, Michael. Um, if you can uh, think back to the customers that have gone through an Office 365 migration, uh, what are some of the challenges that they've experienced uh, during that migration, and, and uh, you know how can they avoid some of those gotchas uh, by working with partners such as yourself? Um, I think uh, the biggest thing is to sit down with our clients to, to have a proper plan. Um, uh, once the uh, uh, organization uh, has the direction, they're willing to go to cloud, uh, that, that's, that's typically number one uh, challenge. Uh, we, uh, with, with the help of our, our team, we, we usually have a fairly good understanding of uh, most uh, organizations set up. And then we uh, 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 help them to devise a plan to, to move in steps. So uh, I know uh, some, sometimes uh, organizations would like to make things happen, you know, in, in like yesterday, but uh, in, in this type of uh, migration typically uh, goes on for, for, for months, like Kevin just mentioned, because you have to make sure uh, everything happens in, in, in stages, and you have to make sure uh, all the right stages uh, are completed before you move on to the next step. Uh, the last thing we want is, you know, we've migrated uh, some mail to the cloud platform, and then your users are I cannot access their mail from their from the mobile device. So, uh, so we plan all of that properly, and uh, um, so uh, that's what we find. You know, most of the challenges uh, nonprofit face is uh, because they don't have that uh, uh, dedicated IT resource. Um, so we we help uh, along that process. In that Great, thanks, Michael. Um, you know, I'll, I'll end uh, this part of the panel discussion with, uh, with just where you can go to, to get more information. Of course, we're here as well right now to answer any questions you might have. Uh, but for organizations that want to take advantage uh, of Office 365 for nonprofits on a donation basis, you just go to office.com, uh, sign up for a trial from there. Uh, you know, we'll uh, validate your not-for-profit status in, in Canada with the assistance of TechSoup. Uh, and from there, we, you're, uh, uh, you can get moving with the trial and engage with a partner such as uh, such as OddComp as well. Uh, so office.com uh, is the site that you guys can visit uh, to get more information. Uh, and we'll open it up at this point in time, Jane, for any questions. Either if you might have some questions based on what we've talked about or, or the audience has any questions. I do have a question. Um, sorry, hi. Kevin, I have some questions for you. Um, since you are the IT person of the nonprofit organization, um, just want to know if you can speak to your experiences on how your role has changed uh, pre-migration and now after Office 365, um, how are you supporting your staff? Um, so supporting, I'm assuming you mean by supporting not the IT staff, but uh, yeah. so with the move, uh, we first and foremost don't have to worry about our Exchange server anymore, which is great considering it was really old and it was the one that was starting to fail and that was causing more issues, um, but that was one huge benefit um, to getting rid of that. We've also changed the way, you know, supporting wise for staff. Um, it hasn't changed much. We were using Exchange before, and now they're running. To, um, there's less issues on the side of our server. Um, I know a couple times we've had issues, and okay, now it's the server problem. We had to go fix that. We haven't really had that now. Uh, we have user issues, it's more usability issues, which hasn't changed the number of. Um, sadly, these are still the same level they were before. Some are improving. <laughs> um, 
So there, there is that, but we've had a lot less technical issues, which is great. Uh, means we can use our technical resources towards other aspects of the organization. Uh, we have gone through lots of big changes. Um, our organization three years ago didn't have an IT department. So we've just recently been going this route with like, internal IT, having the, you know, using different services. Um, I know with Office 65, I don't really have to worry about the email anymore, really, um, other than just helping users navigate through it if they don't know how. So that's been a great benefit um, going from that route. Um, still more technical worry. So I know for a fact if, if there wasn't an IT internally for my organization, this would have been a great resource beforehand because now they don't need the technical expertise to maintain the system, maintain the email. They just need you know someone who knows how to add new users, remove users, and well reset passwords. That's usually a big one. Um, so you know on that side of it, it's been a lot nicer on the technical side. Less you know it's more simple things. You know okay this is where you have to click or. You know, the internet's down, it's been more of a bigger, you know, the internet's down, now we don't have to worry about that. Um, it has put less stress on our network at our head office uh, due to the fact that we used to have everybody logging into their email from all our different remote locations. And then they had to go through our one internet connection. Um, near close to the end of the migration, we did add a second one for the migration itself. But, um, you know, it was hard for, you know, staff to always get in. If, you know, I didn't. You know, I did, I don't think I had that many, but every so often, the internet went down at office after hours. You know, then I get interrupted in the middle of the night saying, "Oh, we can't access our email." Now I don't get that anymore. Email is almost always working. Every so often, I get one, and it's because someone turned off the Wi-Fi or something like that. So, um, yeah, a lot less technical issues is really the biggest thing, and it's more you know, it's just usability, which is, hasn't changed. And my coworker, Kevin, maybe one of you can answer this one. Uh, whenever we move to a new technology, one of my concerns has always been around training and adoption of the new technology. Um, can you guys speak to a little bit of, uh, obviously, I, I think you covered that uh, a bit. A lot of the users, um, and all of us, myself included, I'm so used to using Microsoft Office. And if I were to ask tomorrow to switch to a totally different uh, application, um, it's going to be very frustrating for me um, because I really just want to get things done. I don't care what I'm using. I want it to be easy. Um, would you be able to speak to the training piece? How was it for the adoption of the staff a little bit more? And Michael, is this something that you guys offer um, as one of your services? Uh, right, so uh, for training the staff, um, one of the great benefits was because we were moving from an exchange, like an already exchange system, um, the change wasn't that big in the interface, so there wasn't really a need for training. We did go over it with the management side of it in case there was any questions that came up the chain um, to us. Uh, we had some adoption issues with you know staff. You know the buttons moved over here now, um, so we did do a little bit of training. We went through with all our managers um, during the switch over to make sure that. You know, um, they knew where all the buttons were to make sure they know any new quirks that there were to the system that didn't have before. And then but in added features. A big thing was we had a lot more added features that we wanted to utilize. So one of the biggest things we did do was we did do training specifically on the added features. Um, because we have an internal IT staff, so I'll look to you in a second. Uh, I keep on my train of thought. Uh, we had an internal IT staff. We were able to do internal training. Um, and I know a lot of companies are going to obviously offer training. We, you know, at that point, because we have the staff internally to maintain, do the training, we did do that internally. Um, and I believe you had a question. Kevin, you mentioned uh, added features. Off the top of your head, can you tell us about the top, top two or three added features that required, um, that required um, uh, post training and gave you the biggest bang for your buck? Yeah, so the question was, um, and I'm sorry if I paraphrase, but what features did we need to train on that were beneficial? And what were the top features that we, top two, two or three features that were really good uh, that we got, you know, best bang for a buck? And just to say for the bang for the buck part, it's free, so, you know. It's kind of obvious there, any feature really is that. Uh, one of the biggest features um, that I found personally was 
the SkyDrive part to it, because we didn't originally look into that. We only had email. So adding the SkyDrive feature, allowing us to save documents to the cloud, um, you know, having them know that they're going to be safe. Um, that was always some worries for some staff. Is okay if I save this, what if I lose my laptop? You know, and of course, as IT, we try to maintain backups and stuff like that. But if the user doesn't come into the office for a couple of days and then they lose their laptop without coming into the office for the backup, then you know they still lost their information. Knowing that the cloud was there as a, you know, wherever they are, they they will still go to the cloud and then syncing, of course, to their laptop. So. One of the, I have to say the biggest feature that I've appreciated um, was the fact that, you know, SkyDrive um, as a whole, and that might be part of the solution, so I'm not sure if that's the feature you guys are looking for. But, um, and then another one, I have to think about this because there's a couple that I can think of, but the one major one I think was um, the preview. Um, it maybe seemed like a small thing, um, but preview and office web apps, I love it, personally. It allows us to, you know, when I get a document in, I can just click the preview button. I don't have to download the document and open it in Word, wait for Word to open. Sometimes I'm on a really slow computer. 90% of the time I'm not on my own computer when I'm fixing people. So sometimes it's sad to say, but users don't always, you know, they have to use older computers or if I'm using, you know, someone else's computer and I don't necessarily want to open it up, the document up in their office program so I don't want them to, you know, accidentally find it sometimes. The office preview, the little preview button below the document allowed me to open the documents, preview it right there in Microsoft, uh, in the email without opening it up, which is, I think, one of my favorite parts to it that, you know, just personally, it's been really great. So, all right. Are there any other questions from the Okay, I'll bring them to you. Uh, my question is for Sumit. How many team sites we can open on a SharePoint? Uh, how many team sites? Yes. Um, Not on SharePoint, on Office 365. On Office 365. Yes. Uh, so uh, I want to make sure I'm understanding the question correctly. What you're saying is on the SharePoint offering that's included with Office 365, how many team uh, shares, uh, team sites can you open? Um, that's a good question, a, a technical one. I'm not sure I know the answer offhand. I'll have to go back and, and, uh, and uh, research that a little bit for you. Let me just check if Gareth from my team has an idea, but I know that's a pretty specific it's question. It's a lot, and we just increased the, uh, the storage size as well for SharePoint Online um, through this okay. service. Uh, so I, I will elaborate my question, right? Sure. Right yeah. now, we, we are a nonprofit organization with around uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 different programs. We are working on 10 different programs. Sure. So we, are, we want to open a different uh, sites, team sites on SharePoint. Okay. Not on SharePoint, on Office 365. So can we do that? Or do we have any restrictions if we use Office 365? Uh, yeah, 10, 10 is for sure. Yeah. 10, 10 is for sure. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's 4,000 right and now. How, yeah. much, how much data <laughs> per user we can uh, upload on, a share, on, on Office 365? Right now, the, so we just increased the limits for SkyDrive Pro, which is part of Office 365, to 25 gigabytes per user in their SkyDrive uh, Pro, okay. um, but then also each team site, um, I believe it depends on how you, like they, they just sort of, when you create it, there's this, you can just keep adding so files if, to it. if suppose uh, we exceed our limit from 25 gigs to 50 gigs or 30 gigs or do you have to be extra for that or is this, no, there's no, is, um, is there restrictions? Yeah, there's, for, for SharePoint itself, right, there's, uh, there's a pretty ample amount of storage space on that and you can, um, um, like use that across all your different team sites. So as you're adding team sites, some might have five gigabytes or worth of documents, others might have two megabytes, right? So you just end up sharing the, the storage you get across all of those. Um, and I, th I think it's, um, per user you get about 25, sorry, 25 gigabytes per user in SkyDrive Pro for their own personal documents. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as you add new users, there's an additional amount of storage that gets added uh, to your shared pool for your team sites as well. Right. What about exchange, the emails? That was just upped as well, I think to 25 gigabytes as well, or maybe 50, but yeah. It's, uh, it's 25 there. gigabytes included on the package, or just yeah. for the mail, or the shared one? Uh, that's that's separate from it, separate. so separate amounts per, yeah. Thank you. So a lot of storage space, it's pretty rare you're going to run out of how much, uh, use up that much storage space. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. So on that question of storage, which is a question I was going to ask, so, uh, and I think you've answered. So, 
when you pay this five dollars and twenty cents, each user gets twenty five gigs of storage for files and things. Yep. So, uh, but so you've got the word or up there, and you mentioned what the previous the or was. Do you get twenty five gigs of that? Yes, you do. So, so you just go to the site, you sign up, and you get a free account, and you get twenty five gigs. Yeah. So uh, the only difference between the uh, Office 365 that's available on a donation basis uh, and the premium experience here is you, the storage capabilities, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, capability you get from a web conferencing IAM perspective, they're all the same. The only difference is you get to download the Office applications to your desktop and you get access to these uh, applications on your mobile device as well. In the other version, the, the version that's available on a donation basis, you would access them through your browser. So you still get access to Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, and your email, but you just access them through a modern browser, whether it be Internet Explorer or any other browser that you might be using. But from a storage perspective, uh, uh, you're, you're um, looking at the same amount of storage. So it, it, when uh, the, the middle gentleman talked about the Exchange server, that's got to be a separate component. How, obviously, they switched over to using Exchange Server from the Office 360. How does that all work? That's, is that a separate? Because you're going to set up a, you know, app. You're going to set up your domain name, that yep. whole sort of thing. Yeah. How does that all fit in? So the Exchange Server is included as part of the uh, uh, the cloud services and it's part of Office 365. So your mailbox storage and and your ability to use Microsoft Exchange in the cloud. Uh, to, to host your email is made available through uh, Office 365. Either you procure it on a donation basis at no cost, or you pay for the premium experience and you get the apps as well. So from an exchange perspective, you're getting the same functionality and you have that uh, storage limit uh, that you can use as well for email. Okay, but my understanding is that you have, you, you have to get a machine from somebody to install on your site to set up the exchange or not? No, so this can, is... You, you uh, throw your exchange server away. You got it. Okay. I, I would donate it to someone else maybe or try and resell it. I wouldn't throw it away necessarily. <laughs> what charity is going to take it? They're all going to go this way. Right, so there, there you go. I love to hear that. Um, you know, uh, but you, you don't need any hardware. We, Microsoft is hosting and storing all your information. Uh, and one of the key advantages is we make it available to you uh, across all your devices and from anywhere. So you can access it from home, work, that's what I do, um, and across any device. So this is my tablet, I use it when I'm on the road, I can access my company email or my, some of my private documents as well. Uh, and if I'm at work, at my work laptop, I have the same information available to me as well. Okay, thanks. No problem. I have a question. Uh, if we already use Office 365, actually we use for Exchange ePlan, uh, how we can, we are non profit, how we can transfer to this plan to get the cost deducted? That's a great question. So, are you currently on a trial or no, are you? No, we use for two years. Two years, okay. So, what I would do is we can work with TechSoup uh, and see how we can get your uh, not for profit status validated. Uh, and then we can work to migrate you to either the free version of the service that's available on a donation basis, or this particular version should you choose to uh, take advantage of it as well. And we might have to wait till your subscription ends. Uh, I'm not sure that we'll have to uh, look into that before we can migrate you to the, uh, to the versions that we're talking about here. But you can definitely migrate your current Office 365 um, service offering to any of these should you choose to uh, adopt them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, well, I, I know the uh, management in our uh, company will ask me about security. Um, haven't had my hotmail just recently hijacked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, how safe and secure is that? I know you log in on the web, so um, to access your card drive or, or to access your Outlook, you'd have to create a username and password. How secure is that? I mean, I'm not talking from the Microsoft aspect, but from the user point. Um, a lot of time in our office, um, our staff will open emails that would say, oh, you've got a parcel waiting for you. And they would actually open that and click on the link as well. Right. Uh, how would that affect the, uh, everyone else in our agency using that? Uh, you know, we do have it in place right now. We do have a. Um, you know, really, I just go and turn off the computer and turn it off the, uh, unplug it from the, from the network and deal with it separately, sort of. Yeah. 
how would that uh, you know a, a user would affect the entire network? Uh, other users who are sharing the same files, um, you know, security. I guess it would be especially we're being accredited with the uh, accreditation Canada and haven't had um, major security changes to all to uh, to our um, system. No, I, I'm glad you asked that question. So uh, I'm definitely going to take a stab at it, and then I'm going to ask Kevin uh, and Michael to weigh in as well uh, on this one. So from a security perspective. You know, all our all your data is stored in Microsoft data centers, and we've got large uh, a our services being validated and accredited by a lot of third parties in terms of uptime, uh, security, uh, and safety of the service as well. Uh, and you can read about uh, more about that on Office.com as well. Uh, I can tell you we've got large organizations, uh, you know, Expedia Cruise Ship Centers, uh, Toyota, uh, that have moved to O365 as well. And these organizations have also had, uh, you know, uh, concerns around security, and they've obviously made the choice to move uh, move to Office 365 because they believe that, you know, their data will and their information will be secure. Um, you know, so that's the one thing I would say is uh, you've got um, uh, a high level of, you should have a high level of confidence. Uh, in the security of the, uh, the information that's stored uh, in our data centers, uh, and we have large clients and, and organizations that have uh, that have moved to Office 365 as well. In terms of users, uh, you know, and uh, and their behavior, the one thing I would say is, of course, it's a common practice, and I think Kevin would support me in saying this is, you know, having a strong password uh, is always recommended, whether it be for your corporate uh, email service or your personal email service as well. Uh, you know, uh, rather than something simple as your first name, one, two, three, is probably not recommended. Um, you know, exactly. Uh, so having a strong password is definitely recommended. Um, so that's my take, you know, that's my uh, my perspective on safety and security, but I'll ask Kevin to weigh in as well, and Michael, maybe you've had similar concerns from other uh, not-for-profits as well that you can address. I, I'll just speak from my own experience. Uh, I had some small concerns uh, towards it as well. Um, one of the things we do is different. It's not completely hosted uh, with Exchange. Like we have everything hosted, the services hosted. We still use our internal Active Directory. We use an ADFS server, which is part of our deployment for logging in. So they're not actually logging in through the Microsoft. Well, they do. It's a little weird. I don't want to try to go technical, but um, we log in through our ADFS server. So our usernames, our passwords are all unified across the system. And they're still logging in through our server directly, and it's just I think it's just a token that's shared. Um, we are looking at other options currently, actually, but um, like password sync and stuff. And I know I'm looking into the security of those. We're actually working with Oddcom currently. Uh, we just talked about it this morning uh, about the different benefits and the cost to move towards password sync versus NDFS. Um, so keeping password control internal, so you still have you know all the rules that your Active Directory can apply to the password security. So they keep you know strap passwords, or they have to let you know all that stuff as well. So you still have all those rules, which is you know I think will, at least for me alleviates my concerns. Um, and then I'll go to you. Just keep in mind you you still have control of your uh, environment. Um, um, whether you have uh, your, your own Active Directory integration or you, you're operating as a completely separate uh, entity on the cloud, uh, you have that full control. Uh, we have some users uh, where they, they lost their phones and they're scared that their information will be leaked by anybody who's grabbed their phones. You have the ability of remotely wipe those devices, uh, no matter what. You know, it's cross-platform Windows phones. Blackberry, Androids, or iOS devices, you have that full control to, to, to do that. So uh, it, it, at a point that is sometimes is more secure than your existing investment right now, because you, you may not have that enterprise grade of uh, hardware and software combined to, to have that security on your network. So Microsoft, basically, this offering is giving it to you with the top level uh, type of uh, security and, 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 and enterprise features that you, you will get. So um, I, I, I think it's a great uh, idea that Microsoft is doing this. Any other questions? I was just wondering if the link feature had a share screen option for web, web conferencing. Uh, so you can share what you so this is about so you can share what your uh, what's on your computer with others that you're collaborating with? Exactly. Yeah, it does. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, it does.
question. Um, we're on um, Exchange 365 right now, and um, we had that done for us by an IT company. And I confess, um, and we're not using it anymore, we're just going along on our own. Uh, and I don't know how to add a user. Is there help? Um, you know, would someone um, at the help center talk me through doing that, or how, would I, how do I know how to do that? Is there tutorials? Uh, so that's a great uh, great question. So a couple of uh, avenues for support. I mean, if you've got a partner or an IT company that helped you migrate, in your case, well, you, you did or didn't? Sorry. We do, but yeah. we, uh, we wouldn't want to have to call them for something like that. Okay, like that. got it. Um, so in terms of uh, training, there's a lot of information available on the web as well uh, that you can gain access to through our community forums and, and so on and so forth in terms of how do you access this information. Plus there's help documentation from an admin console uh, perspective on how do you add users to your uh, service as well, or add a new user and create a new username. Jamie, anything else you want to add to uh, from a support perspective where they can go to get introduced? Yeah, to sure. So I'll just introduce myself. My name is Jamie Sergente. I'm a sponsor for Microsoft. Oh, thank you for uh, Office 365 for nonprofits at Microsoft. Um, so the the short answer is we absolutely do have avenues for any person in the room who are looking for administration type support on the service. And the answer is yes. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do that. Uh, to Sunit's point, we have a, invested heavily in online assets. And so if you go to office.com, we have technical documentation that you can leverage. And I encourage you to Bing it or use any other online search tool to find what you're looking for. The second avenue, of course, is our customer support line, which is manned, regular business hours. You can call anytime, and they will walk you through administration type processes. They're also there for break fix, but when you have an issue like, hey, I don't know how to add a user, you can feel free to call them anytime. There's a third avenue, which is uh, more for our, our technical folks like Kevin in the room, or partners like Michael at OddComp uh, called TechNet. And again, we will document very deeply, step-by-step -step processes to do this. But I, you know, I always say this to our customers, when in doubt, simply reach out to our customer support. The 1-800 number is listed right on your admin panel. Uh, you can do that even as a trial partner, or sorry, as a trial participant. You don't have to be paying us to, to contact our support. We, we offer that recognizing that it's a critical component of how you consume the services. Uh, so those are three avenues, again, just to recap. Online on office.com, uh, call our customer support when in doubt. And finally, if you are super technical and you want to get in the nuts and bolts like folks like Kevin and, and uh, uh, Michael's group from OddComp, encourage you to go to TechNet. Thanks. It's great to see a lot of you wanting to ask questions. Um, I'm going to try to get to all of you. Uh, so. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Sherman, and just a question, hopefully it's not too detailed question. Um, so how's the uh, integration like between Office Web App, um, SkyDrive Pro, and SharePoint? So an example would be I'm on the road and I want to access uh, documents on my SkyDrive Pro, and how can I um, save it to SharePoint to share with the rest of my team? Uh, great question. So I'll um, actually, Kevin, have you gone through this scenario? Because I can definitely answer it because I've done this from a, a personal perspective and corporate perspective, but I'd love to get your uh, experience as well. I've done it personally. Um, so the one thing I do, like, um, and maybe I just don't know how but to say, like, for instance, um, one thing I've seen with the lack um, is if I get an email with an attachment and I want to save it right to SkyDrive, there's no easy button to do that. Uh, but it is still pretty straightforward because I have a folder synced on my computer or on my phone, download the app and just say save to SkyDrive. Um, so you just have to you know, still download it, save it, and then choose a folder. And because it's synced, it's just choosing the SkyDrive folder. It's not you know, saving it and uploading it or anything like that. Um, moving from SkyDrive to SharePoint, um, it's the same thing. Um, just you know, saving it to the right spot. I'm not sure if there's another way to do it, um, personally. Uh, but it is still pretty easy, so it's not that difficult. Yeah. Uh, so I personally have gone through it uh, using two options. Uh, one is through the browser. Uh, it's also, if I'm working on a document, I just uh, click Save As. It'll give me the option of do I want to save on my SkyDrive, and I can save it to my SkyDrive and then access it later from any device. Um, so I do that as well. Uh, I can also access my SkyDrive or a SharePoint site that we're working on directly through the browser as well and just upload a document uh, to SkyDrive. Uh, another option that will be made available for folks that, uh, that take advantage of the premium option is right within the application itself. So let's say you're working on a Word document. Um, right within the application on your, uh, on your laptop or your tablet, 
you will be given the option when you click Save As, it'll tell you, do you want to save it to uh, your hard drive, do you want to save it to your SkyDrive, or any other site. And if you're using a SharePoint rather than SkyDrive, you could save it directly on that, uh, that SharePoint as well. Okay, well uh, you mentioned one thing about that. You don't need to pay for the, you can buy Office separately and still use those features. I don't yeah. Yeah, that, no, but yeah. that's what we do. We don't pay the $5 a month. Um, our finance department has decided that's not worth the cost. We don't have all of our users have desktops that use it. So we went out, we purchased the Microsoft Office suite and then just installed it on the computers and we still use, you know, the free ver like no, the nonprofit version and still have all the features across the board and all we had to do was just pay up front for the Office suite. Um, and Office 2010 works as well and I believe Office 2007, I haven't personally seen it, but I believe it works as well. Yeah, I think one of the one of the key things that we make available to uh, to not for profits and actually all our customers is we allow you to move to the cloud on your own pace as fast as you want to and how you want to consume. So a couple of examples we've heard today, you know, Kevin's organization has just moved their uh, mail to the cloud and now they're exploring SharePoint, leveraging SharePoint. And some people are already leveraging Link. Uh, you know, if in your organization uh, you can definitely use the Office 365 offering that's available on a donation basis. For uh, uh, most of your users, if you have a sub-segment that are power users that you want to take advantage of this option, you can do that as well. Or you could go the other route, as Kevin's talked about, which is just buy the software at a, um, at a discounted price as well. That's, uh, you know, like you have been doing, uh, and you can access these applications through there as well. The beauty is it works seamlessly together. So whether you have a user that's on Office 365, the version that's available on a donation basis, they would still have access to their email, they could still work on the same document uh, or PowerPoint file that you're working on through their browser. You could have accessed it if you're one of those power users in the organization. You could be accessing it through the actual Word application that's on your machine itself. Yeah, so this is uh, just a follow-up to the previous question about, uh, about dealing with uh, users, etc. Um, what our organization always tries to, we're, we're um, IT organization as well. Uh, we always try to, within the organization, if they don't have uh, in-house IT support, um, try to, look with, to, to find one or two people to be champions of the program, to get them to uh, learn some of the basic administration and to document everything. So that this way they're not having to call us to add a user. And that's what you try to do uh, as you're implementing the solution. So that, uh, so that you're not getting a, a phone call every time somebody you know, forgets their password, et cetera. You don't need to have, a, a, especially with something like Office 365, you don't need to have full-time IT staff if your budgets don't uh, or can't handle it. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to constantly be paying for an IT person to deal with the little things. So if you plan ahead, and you determine in your organization who can be the sort of champion. Uh, and you, you sort of have it already, the people who deal with your accounting software or other uh, software that, that you run uh, with your, your donation software, et cetera. Those are the kind of people you want to identify and have them involved in the project with the IT and the management um, so that they're available to deal with those kinds of, of issues. That's a great suggestion, thank you. So I'm conscious of time. Um, I do want to let you guys know, if your stomach is grumbling, that we have wonderful lunch set up for you outside. All of the food uh, you see here today is locally sourced um, and organic. Uh, the device bar is up and running as well, because uh, we're talking a lot about Office 365 in this room. But if you want to see it in action, see it on the different devices, please feel free to visit the device bar. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is get maybe two or three more questions going. Um, so one question over here, and, and then one over here, and I, I know there are uh, people, folks online that probably have some questions as well. So thank you guys, we're gonna try and wrap this up. Hi. Um, I'm actually a Microsoft Office trainer. However, um, I purchased Microsoft Office for Small Business in July. And I purchased it at the Yorkdale store and I got the computer there and a touch screen and Microsoft Office for small business. And I just found that it was incredible where I could pay, I think it was $200 for two years for complete and other technical support, mm -hmm. and then $100 a year for 
two training sessions. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't, I wanted to know if that is available for the nonprofit as well, if that's something that. Uh, sorry, Ron, do you want to? Well, Michael is running out to get Caden. Okay. He's, the, he's, he's our rep from Microsoft Store. Okay, great. He's a development specialist, and he can. Because <laughs> I personally have found that to be absolutely incredible. Great. No, nope, that's a, uh, so I'm going to wait for, uh, oh, I, hey Sharon, I'm wondering if you could just repeat your question for the gentleman from Microsoft Stores. Okay, I'm not a nonprofit, and I purchased Microsoft Office for small business, and I was able to get, for a very low cost, um, 52 training sessions and complete another technical support for the computer for two years. And I just wanted to know if any version of that or something like that is available. Um, for nonprofit or specifically for the individual? Pardon me? For nonprofit. For nonprofit? Yes. Um, our training is our training. Sorry. Our training is pretty much open to any organization. Now you ask me if there is a different pricing structure for nonprofit as there are to um, uh, just regular users or. I just I say I I have a really good experience with Microsoft Store and training and support, and I just wonder what's available for other people. Um, well, I mean, one of the great things that Microsoft really believes in firmly is giving back to the community. Uh, you've been to the store, you, you know that there's the theater space in the back um, that we utilize is free of charge for anyone that is looking for the space. Uh, seats up to 20 people. Um, there's specific workshops that we offer through Microsoft, but if there are things that you guys want to basically, you know, train on or show some of your employees or staff or whatever it is, um, the space is there free of charge to use as much as you want, as much as you need it to be used. Um, as long as it's available, you're more than welcome to it. Um, all of our PAs are specialized, our product advisors are specialized in a particular, con or a particular um, I guess, product, software, whatever that is. If there's, somebody, if there's something that you're looking for that we don't offer, we can either find someone that can offer it, or if you guys have someone that you just want to use a space with to teach on, then you're more than welcome to do that. So I don't know if that answers the question at all. Yeah, so it's, it's available to everybody. It's available to everyone as long as the space is there um, and it's free. You're more than welcome to it. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, we provide drinks, snacks. Um, we can use the space for anything that you want. So I'll add to that as well. So thank you. Uh, so definitely I'd say you know the, the training uh, packages that are at the Microsoft Store at Yorkdale are available for everyone. I don't believe there's a different pricing structure for not-for-profits. Okay, no. uh, that being said, uh, there are a couple other avenues for training as well. Um, one is uh, if you're using a partner such as Oddcom uh, for your migration and as you deploy Office 365, uh, you can definitely reach out to them and any other partner for training as well. I think there was a good suggestion uh, from the audience member as well that when you uh, when you are rolling Office 365 out, it's good to have some champions or some advocates so they could you know sort of train the trainer and then they train uh, the rest of the folks in the organization as well. There's a lot of to Jamie's point there are a lot of training videos and documentation online as well that you can point your end users to within your organization as well when it comes to uh, using our software as well. So those are, I'd say, the different options that, uh, that people can take advantage of. Okay, one, uh, one quick question here regarding Exchange. We're, we've been using Hosting Exchange for four or five years now. Is there any difference between what's included with 365 as to what we've experienced to date? Uh, you know, I'm going to let Jamie take that. I don't believe there are any significant differences between Hosted exchange and uh, so when sorry, I have, to, I have to qualify the question. When you say hosted exchange, what do you mean specifically? We're using an outside provider. Oh, okay. Do you know what version of the the server platform they're on? No idea. Yeah. So what we find is um, it's it's a common scenario. So this gentleman today is relying on what we usually call as a hoster. Um, you think of these as the net firms of Canada or or in the, in the U.S. rack space, where you pay them a monthly subscription per user. Typically, this is probably what you're paying to use a version of our software where they deliver it to you on our behalf. Um, and so the one thing I'll say is uh, we don't differentiate our offering between the most current version available to our hosters and Officer 65. So the assumption is that they're using Exchange 2013, the most, most recent version of our release, that they've published that to their end users like yourself. Okay, I, I think we're using 2010 at the moment. Yeah, so you would see. We're one step behind. Yeah. So the second question with that is what the devices, the mobile devices that we have support through the system, um, the current provider is not supporting any BlackBerry devices. Uh, it's active sync type connection as opposed to BlackBerry software. We've got quite a number of BlackBerries and other devices. What is the support 
for 365? Is it using the BlackBerry software or is it? It's a great question. So the other question is, how do I support my devices uh, that may not be a Windows uh, phone, which Kevin spoke with spoke about earlier in his presentation? So the short answer is, we've actually partnered really deeply with BlackBerry, and we deliver uh, BlackBerry Business Cloud Services (BBCS) to our end uh, to our end, end customers. So we actually broker the, uh, the the typical BEZ service, the BlackBerry Enterprise service, to our customers via our our own infrastructure. So the way the, the I'll give you a little bit of background. The way the service works is we uh, host BlackBerry Enterprise Server in our data center, and then we deliver mail using all the mobile device management methodologies and conventions that BlackBerry uses to our end users. So the, the short of it is, uh, what we find often is, you know, you have a, a gentleman, what's your name, Jim? Jim. Jim, who's paying a third party to host his uh, mail, and he may even pay them a fee to host his, his BlackBerry server. We offer the same thing. What you're seeing here, we here today is, we'll offer the email server on, on the, uh, the free model, for free, you'd have to pay an incremental user amount, I believe, I'd have to check for you, I can put that down as a question, uh, for the BlackBerry service, because it is a premium offering, but we offer that in our data center, and so, you know, the typical things like outages and pain with mobile device management, we take care of all that. Uh, and you, again, you can contact our customer support if you have issues, uh, but yeah, what we're trying to do is get you out of the game of dealing with many different vendors, or managing your own software, so you can just focus on what you're doing. And uh, that's why we offer those services inside of Office 365. So the answer is yes, we offer it. It's a premium product. I don't know the pricing structure specifically, but I know you would have to pay in advance of it. But we'll give you the email platform for free. And given that you're on exchange, it's really easy to move over. Okay, okay perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we've been having some great um, questions and discussion online. I can't ask you all of the questions because there's a lot. Um, but I'll pick a couple of them that might be relevant to everyone. So quite a few people were asking about uh, this particular one, which is um, regarding sort of where the storage is. If, if they're uh, a customer in Canada, or is the data stored on Canadian servers, or is it stored everywhere in the world? And just if you could speak to that, kind of that security aspect a little bit. Yeah, that's great. So uh, uh, the data is stored in our Microsoft data centers, which are located worldwide. Uh, so it's not stored in Canada. Uh, but again, from a safety and security perspective, I think we've addressed that. You know, we've got uh, our safety and security is validated by a lot of third parties. Uh, even reliability and from an uptime perspective is, is being validated by a lot of third parties and international organi uh, organizations that set standards on safety and security. Uh, and we have a lot of customers, large customers as well, uh, and not-for-profits, such as Kevin's work, that have moved to Office 365 as well. So I'd say safety and security, uh, we've got that nailed and looked at. Okay, and then I have a couple of questions for Kevin. Um, so, and actually maybe this first one other people can speak to as well. Um, a lot of discussion around um, since everything is being coming over the internet with the cloud, um, have people been finding a need for increasing their bandwidth of their internet, and especially given that in Canada bandwidth is kind of expensive, is that something people should be concerned about when thinking about the cloud? Um, so towards that, we've had the reverse effect um, in the fact that our head office was where everything was stored. So we had lots of bandwidth coming into head office before we moved. Because we're so diverse, uh, dispersed, sorry, uh, we have lots of different, all these different locations all accessing it. Um, so we've actually seen an increase. Um, there has been a couple of complaints from our head office of a decrease in speed of internet and all that stuff, um, but that could also be other factors. Um, it could, you know, the head office is our biggest office, most number of employees, and they did, of course, used to access it directly to the server over the local network, which is really, really fast. Um, so they've complained a bit about slowing down the speed, but all the other locations, all the remote offices, all the other places for us has increased because of the fact they no longer have to go into one connection. So yes and no, I guess. <laughs> Michael, is this something that you've heard your customers? Uh, what's your viewpoint? Actually, yes. In fact, the, the, the reverse effect is true because um, you may have a head office where the, the, the server is so mission critical that you, you want to uh, make sure there's sufficient bandwidth or, or sometimes redundant bandwidth to protect it. But uh, moving your infrastructure to the cloud, basically, uh, um, that, that, that effect staying at the head office is no longer true. All the other uh, uh, locations, you're including your, your, your main office, are accessing uh, the server in the Microsoft Cloud the same way. So uh, uh, you no longer have to uh, um, 
uh, keep that critical connection at, at, your, at your main office anymore. Everybody can kind of uh, uh, keep the same uh, lower, perhaps slightly lower level of, uh, of connection requirement uh, because it's, it's now uh, um, being stored on the cloud and it's always backed up and it's redundant up there. So, uh, and, and guess what, if your site is down, there's always the mobile devices that you can access via uh, 3G or LTE uh, to, to gain your, your, your information that way. So, um, I, I think the reverse effect is true. Um, okay, there's a question back there. So, there'll be more questions uh, online, but maybe I'll get them to connect directly with you guys afterwards. Thanks. Earlier, you alluded to passport security, and presumably, Microsoft has a 24 alphanumeric encoded password. How many digits should I have to be secure? How many digits should you have to be secure? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think it's a bit too technical. So here's what I'll say uh, from my perspective, and I'll, I'll talk about my personal experience on this one. Uh, when I set my passwords, I make sure that they're a alphanumeric, uh, uh, they have a bit of uh, alphabets, I've got a couple of symbols and a couple of uh, uh, numbers in them as well. I usually range personally between from 8 to 12, but I think each organization, depending on, and I'll let uh, Kevin talk to this, but each organization can set their own standards in terms of what they want their password parameters and configuration to look like for their organization. Kevin, how do you guys handle sort of a recommendation on what should be the ideal length of a password? Um, I think officially a recommendation is a minimum of eight characters with uppercase, lowercase, and numbers. Um, getting people to follow that is always a, you know, there's, you know, getting people to follow it is always a problem sometimes. Um, what I've recently learned, and this is something I just personally found out, and I started doing personally, um, and it's an interesting concept. Instead of going towards a password, um, which is a really, you know, people think of one word, a couple numbers. Um, I've learned, and it really works really well for users who've done it, is a passphrase. It's a, it's a kind of different look at it, where instead of using a word with a couple of numbers, you use a sentence. So, you know, if you used to use your kid's name as your password, instead of say, just putting their name, put my kid's names are, and then list them. And just make sure to capitalize every other word or something like that. Uh, maybe add a number, you know, or say I have two kids named, and then put the number two instead of the, the word two. Um, and it seems to work well with our users and the fact that people who've started doing that, now they've created these really strong passwords that aren't just, you know, eight letters. They're now like four or five words, which each are five or six letters each. And now these passwords are like incredibly long and people are like, how do you remember that? But it's because it's a sentence and not a, you know, and then also added benefit, I always tell them, is add like an explanation mark or a period at the end, and that adds a whole other level as well onto it. Um, and I recently just read a blog about that, and I thought that was something amazing. So I started doing it for all mine, and I started recommending it to some of my staff as well. Um, I know some have taken to it, some have not, um, but I, that's my own personal experience there. Thank you, that was a good answer. <laughs> there are websites out there that you can check the strength of your password. So your your typical uh, uh, a few letters plus few uh, numbers can be very easily cracked. So the importance of adding that uh, uh, capitalization and extra number, extra special characters, it's going to help uh, uh, your organization to protect uh, uh, these passwords. Also, set your IT policies uh, every three months or so, uh, maybe maybe sooner. Uh, force your users to change passwords as well, and make sure that it's implemented in your organization that um, they do not repeat their passwords. Um, they may have most, most organizations. Uh, they may have one set of password for the three months, and then the other set, and then they easily rotate back. So you know, don't do that. Just make sure you have a proper IT policy to protect your organization. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So let me see if I understand this correctly. With Office 365, you get enterprise level security, enterprise level applications, enterprise level support, all available to you nonprofit know, organizations for free. And if you want uh, premium services such as the ability to download uh, desktop, desktop apps or mobile apps or have the BlackBerry support that is also available to you at a, pre uh, at a very affordable cost. And if you can get yourself to a Microsoft store, there's also free space and food. And drinks. Isn't this awesome? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so for the next hour or so, uh, we do have free food for you outside. We're on the topic of free. Uh, mm -hmm. There is the device bar for you to explore all the different Microsoft products. Uh, all of the Microsoft experts are going to be around in the room, so there will be tons of chances for you to ask your questions still. I'm just very anxious to feed you on empty stomachs. So thank you guys so much for coming today. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, contact Microsoft or Texas Canada. Our role really, our mandate is to help you with technology. So uh, I want to thank you all for spending your time.